Hello, this is Karen Launchbaugh. I'm a professor of rangeland ecology at the University of Idaho. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to talk a little bit about land ownership and land use of rangelands in the U.S. So whether land is used for livestock grazing, a pretty traditional use of rangelands, or whether those lands have been converted to agricultural lands or roads and cities. We'll talk about those patterns now. So who actually owns the land that is here in the U.S.? According to a Washington Post article in 2017, most of it, about 60% of it, is owned by private citizens like you and I. Private land ownership accounts for about 60% of U.S. land. About a third of it is owned by, federal, by the federal government, and then the remainder is owned by state governments, county and local governments, and tribal authorities. So let's start by focusing on the federal land and think about where it's located. So this is 65 million acres of land in the U.S. It's about 30% of the nation's total land surface. And where is it located? It's located mostly in the west. All the red marks on this map are, make it clear that those, the western states west of the Rockies is where most of the federal lands are located. Who manages those federal lands? Of course, they're owned by all the people, but who manages them? The agency that manages the greatest proportion of federal lands is the Bureau of Land Management, about 20, 247 million acres. Next, the Forest Service, the green on the map, about 193 million. Fish and Wildlife Service, largely um, through uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Refuges, about 90 million acres in the West. And then the National Park Service also has about 84 million acres. So those are the top four agencies that manage federal lands in the U.S. Let's take a closer look at those land management agencies that manage these federal lands. In the Department of Interior, the oldest uh, agency that manages land established in 1916 is the National Park Service. Of course, the National Park Service, its major goal is to manage land, wildlife, and historic resources. So its role in understanding and keeping historic values is something a bit unique to that agency. The Fish and Wildlife Service, as the name would indicate, is mostly uh, dedicated to man managing wildlife and habitat conservation and also wildlife-related recreation. The Bureau of Land Management manages nearly all of the uses of the land's under its care, and those include domestic grazing, mining, timber, energy extraction, and fish and wildlife habitat. So if you look at the Department of Agriculture, a couple of important agencies in that, um, in that uh, department would include the Forest Service, which was established in 1905. Its main uh, primary resources for management, of course, are forest products, but also grazing and fish and wildlife habitat and recreation. The Natural Resources Conservation Service is also in the Department of Agriculture, but it doesn't actually own very much land, just, just a very little. It doesn't own much land because the way that it manages land is by working with private landowners. So in collaboration with private landowners, the Natural Resources Conservation Service helps to instill a conservation practices, uh, establish conservation easements, and to change uses such as uh, what is being done with the Conservation Reserve Program. Just recently, a very interesting report was published in uh, Bloomberg News by David Merrill and Lauren Leatherby, and it, it is pretty cool in that it gives a graphic way to help understand how the lands of the U.S. are used and how that drives our economy. So if you get a chance to take some uh, a deeper look at this, go to Bloomberg.com slash graphics slash 2018-US-land-use. I'm going to go through these slides for you here, but it's a really interesting article. In this report, Merrill and Leatherby used uh, surveys, satellite imageries, and they used the general categorizations of various federal agencies. In this situation, they used categorizations from the U.S. Department of Agriculture of pasture and range, forest, croplands, special uses, miscellaneous, and urban. And uh, each of these blocks on this map represent 250 thousand acres and so if you look at it you can see where much of the pasture and range is in the west and where the urban centers are and we're going to go through these one by one so if you gather all those blocks together and try to take a little closer look at how land is used in the u.s this graph de depicts that about most of the land is used for pasture and range about a fifth of the land in the 48 contiguous states is used for cropland so that's that brown area 
And then if you took it all the areas that are urban, that would account for just that northeast part or that pink, those pink blocks. And we're going to go through each of these individually. Even though urban areas make up just about 3.6% of the total area of the 48 contiguous states, four in five Americans live and work and play in cities. Uh, with so much of the U.S. population in urban areas, it is little surprise that these areas contribute an oversized amount to our economy. The 10 most productive metropolitan areas alone contribute 40% of the U.S. GDP or gross domestic product in 2016. And as you may have realized, the U.S. is becoming more urbanized at an average rate of about a million additional acres each year. This is equivalent to adding an urban area the size of Los Angeles, Houston, and Phoenix combined each year. U.S. urban areas uh, have quadrupled since 1945. The U.S. categorizes national parks, wildlife areas, highways, railroads, military areas, and others as in what they call special use areas. And another U.S. land class classification miscellaneous includes cemeteries, golf courses, marshes, deserts, and other areas of low economic value. And in this map, you can see the blue as special use and the gray as uh, miscellaneous. In this depiction, you can see the blue box would rep represent the special use areas, and that would include defense, Department of Defense land, state parks, national parks, farmsteads, airports, railroads, rural highways. And of this 100 million acres that is special use, notice that 64.4 are in wilderness areas. And wilderness areas, as you know, are ones that um, exclude most of the commercial activities such as logging, mining, and grazing. The gray parts on this chart are um, what they would call miscellaneous areas. So they're wetlands, swamps, waters, very, uh, very barren deserts, uh, rural residential properties, exurban development, and then even golf courses account for quite a few um, acres, two million acres in all. Agriculture lands take up about a fifth of the country. Now let's take a little closer look at that one fifth of the U.S. or about 100, I'm sorry, 392 million acres that is cropland. It's interesting that only about 20% of that, or 77 million, is land that is actually used to produce food that we eat as Americans. Um, more than a third of the entire corn crop, for example, is devoted to ethanol production. Most cropland is used for livestock feed, um, exports, or left idle to let the land recover as, um, idle, and, uh, as idle or fa fallow land. And plus, there's also a significant amount of cropland that is used to produce non-food products such as cotton. The largest land use in the under continental 48 is, of course, for pasture and grazing. That's about one third of the U.S. land. Nearly 25 percent of that land is owned and managed by the federal government, and it occurs mostly in the West. That, that land that is managed by federal government is open to grazing under a fee system. But of course, livestock graze not just on pasture and range. They're also fed crops, and so if you take all the land uh, that is occupied by livestock, the pasture and range, plus the land that is used to produce feed for livestock. That's 41% of the continental U.S. that is used for feeding livestock. So very important use of land in the U.S. is, is livestock production. Forest lands, both federally and privately land, are also very important for the production of timber, wood, and wood products, and uh, that they constitute about a quarter of the continental U.S. So if you put this all together, this map gives you a rough sense of all the ways that the U.S. land is used. I notice in the middle that livestock production, again, is a very large part of that, and most of that is cattle on pasture and range. Sheep and goats and others and horses are a smaller percentage. And in this class on rangeland management, we will talk largely about livestock production, but also somewhat about timber and wilderness areas and state park management. So now let's think globally about rangelands and, the, and their uses across the globe. Uh, in this map, everything that is not a light green color is rangeland. The woodlands and savannas, shrublands, grasslands, tundras, and barren land would all be under the management of rangelands. So are all these lands grazing lands? Are they used to produce livestock? Well, recall that not all rangeland is grazed by livestock. All rangeland is grazed by something. Uh, largely insects and small rodents and small animals, uh, but not necessarily livestock. Furthermore, 
not all land that is grazed by livestock is rangelands. Livestock also graze pasture lands, graze land, uh, crop lands, and forests. So don't conflate the rate term rangeland with grazing land. But having said that, grazing is very important across the globe. If we delve a little bit deeper into the use of livestock on rangelands, let's think globally again. And I want to con compare and contrast pastoralism versus ranching. In a way, they're the same, but they're a little bit different. So let's think about pastoralism versus ranching. A little closer look at people who would be called pastoralists. Now, this isn't a very strict definition, but generally we think of pastoralists as those who own little or no land individually. They often graze communally and often on lands that are uncontrolled or open range. They're not controlled by a government. Um, there are several hundred million people that live as pastoralists, mostly in Africa and Asia. And it's important because they produce high value food in the form of livestock products in a place where crops cannot be grown. So the term pastoralist also is most often used to describe nomadic herders, primarily in developing countries. countries. Take a look at this video. It really is an, uh, a cool video that describes the extent and importance of pastoralism. And it's given to us by the, produced by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations and what they are doing to try to help improve the lives of these pastoral communities. Uh, so you could click, uh, you could write down this YouTube video or I will put it in the notes for this video so you can click on it. Turn to the term ranchers, which is more of a Western term used mostly in the US. A similar term uh, to describe these folks would be called grazers in Australia. But basically, these are people who own deeded land. They own the land that they graze. They often graze a mix of private and public, but their main operation is held on some deeded land. Often generational family ranches produce livestock at a low cost and impact compared to croplands or other uses of land. Uh, production and conservation goals are important to most ranchers. And he, this is a very interesting video that is um, produced by Audubon about a rancher in the plains who was very interested in uh, conserving uh, ground nesting birds, migratory birds. So take a look at how this woman um, constitutes or, or brings both production of livestock and conservation goals into her operation. So I mentioned that ranchers in the western U.S. often graze on a mix of private or deeded lands and public lands including both federal and state lands. But so let's take a little bit closer look at that grazing on public lands. First of all, remember that grazing on private lands is wholly integrated with the public lands. There's not big lines between someone when they're working on their private lands and when they're moving to their deeded lands. And ranchers try to think of a whole enterprise that includes this mix of land ownerships. A lot, livestock grazing on federal lands is very important. 95% of all BLM land is grazed, and about 58%, about 60% of U.S. Forest Service lands are actually grazed. And if you look at the other side of that, about 88% of beef cattle in Idaho and much of the West graze at least a portion of the year on these federal lands. Another thing that's important about modern ranchers is what they do to preserve open space. So many conservationists are, import, are um, working with ranchers to create working landscapes, places that are grazed, but that are open and not uh, subject to subdivision um, by uh, exurban development and other uses. So conservation easements to maintain open space have become very important. And take a look at this video to show how a California rancher actually raised beef in a sustainably way, in sustainable way for stewardship. So you can write down that YouTube video or I will put a link at the bottom of this uh, YouTube presentation. So why are ranchers and conservationists working to create open space and avoid subdivision and exurban development? Well, because those uh, effects have uh, pretty large eco ecological effects, although they might be very nice places to live, such as in this uh, picture of a, of a from Google Earth uh, in 2002, that was just a meadow. By 2017, it was a subdivision, a development. And so why is that bad? Well, uh, a lot of reasons, but ecologically, it causes fragmentation, fragments uh, habitat, and making it less valuable for wildlife species, increased roads and fences that can be uh, problems for both wildlife, but also movement of water. 
Uh, there's an introduction of exotic species. Yeah, we think about weeds and ornamental plants as one, but also cats and dogs, which can be quite um, a problem for birds and other wildlife species. And so then what we see in terms of the wildlife species, we see them going from more specialist kinds of species, such as sage grouse or sharp tail grouse that have kind of fairly defined uh, habitat needs to more general species like um, pheasants or coyotes or raccoons, all which can seem to live in, in many types of conditions. Now just to drill down a little bit more on that idea of working landscapes and preserving open landscapes by using them for grazing and ranching, here's an interesting study I'd like to share with you that was um, conducted by several researchers out of Colorado State University. And what they did was they studied some areas in, near Livermore, Colorado, and they uh, compared ranches from 1957 to 1994 and they looked at ranches that were either intact stayed the same or were sold and subdivided so here's an example of intact ranch number one you see where how many buildings the red blocks and how many improved roads and unimproved roads and, and the changes from 1957 to 1994 not remarkable in fact even there's one less building in 94 than there was in 57. Here's another ranch, an intact ranch, stayed as a ranch from 57 to 94. And again, you see very few changes in the number of buildings or the number of improved roads. A little bit, but not too much. Now let's compare that to a ranch that was subdivided. In 1957, a few buildings, a few improved roads, to 1994, improved or paved roads throughout much of this landscape. And so if you start to think about what, how that's affected wildlife habitat and water quality and other aspects of the ecosystem, you can see that having those open spaces um, of a ranch that was not subdivided is important. Here's another example. Subdivided ranch in 57, very few buildings, very few improved roads except along the perimeter and some unimproved uh, gravel and two track type roads. In 94, that land was subdivided and you can see a great increase in the number of improved roads and buildings, again, which can cause problems for wildlife and for the management of natural resources. Just to, although that seems pretty obvious, just some of the data that comes out of that um, paper that was about preserving open spaces shows um, a pretty much a, a pretty similar uh, situation in intact ranches, a few more roads. Um, actually less buildings in 94 than in 57 of the patches that they studied. And if you think about fragmentation, the number of rangeland patches increased a little bit. But compared to the, the land that was subdivided, the ranch that was subdivided, radical increase in the density of roads, the number of buildings, and the number of patches or the patchiness which would, in, would indicate increased fragmentation. Another interesting study done by several researchers out of Colorado State University looked at uh, the role that maybe that those invasive species might play. And so they looked at native and non-native plant cover and they looked at ranchettes. So those are um, ranches that were divided into smaller uh, ranch areas, exurban development. They looked at ranches and then they looked at reserves, which were basically state parks and areas that were reserved for natural uh, for natural resources. What they found was the native plants, the, the cover of native plants stayed roughly the same in those three, but what was lower was the cover of non-native species. That was lowest on the ranches. There's a lot of reasons why that might occur. Ranchers are certainly equipped to manage invasive species. They can learn them, they have the equipment to manage them, and it's also of great benefit to working ranches to keep invasive species down, much more difficult in ranchettes where groups of people would have to come together and collaborate, and in reserves where there's often more human activity. So those are just a few ideas about land use and ownership in the U.S. Just uh, remember how important livestock are as a use across the West, and then also how we could use working landscapes to preserve open space. Two important points about land use and ownership in the U.S.